flu and the contribution of nurses in protecting the people in, in England. So, Louise, please. Thank you very much. I was a bit concerned when I came up here that you wouldn't be able to see me at all above the podium, but <laughs> we're fine. I don't need a box to stand on. Um, I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me here to speak today uh, in this amazing venue. I just have to make sure my talk is interesting enough so that I get invited back. Um, I want to talk today about the crucial role that nurses play in the um, immunisation programme in England. I'll give a brief overview of the healthcare system in England. Um, I'll talk a bit about the flu programme and then I'll focus in on the role of nurses. Um, my conflict of interest is I am a nurse, so obviously think that we have a very important role. So most of you will be aware that um, in the UK we have the National Health Service, which was established in 1948. It's free at the point of delivery and funded through general taxation. Um, it is a devolved system, so each of the four countries of the UK um, have different policies and priorities. There are a huge amount of similarities, but there are also some crucial differences. So most of my talk today will be focusing on England. Now in 2013, we had a major reorganisation in the NHS. Um, I'm not going to go into it in detail because it is hugely complicated, but just to point out um, two of the big changes. Um, was a set, first one was a set up of two new organisations in healthcare. Um, NHS England were set up and they're responsible for the delivery of healthcare. And the second one was Public Health England um, and they provide expert technical support to both the Departments of Health and NHS England. Second major change was that a lot of the responsibility for commissioning healthcare was devolved to a local level. Um, and that includes um, GP, our general practitioner, primary health care physician, led clinical commissioning groups, and also the development of commissioning of public health. Um, so school health, sexual health, drugs and alcohol are all commissioned at a local level. Some programmes remained at a national level, including immunisation and screening programmes. The aim of the UK flu vaccination programme is to offer Im immunisation to all those who are at increased risk of complications from flu and also their carers. We started with our flu programme in the late 1960s um, in high risk groups. That was extended then in 2000 to all people over 65. In 2010, pregnancy was added as a clinical risk category following the um, pandemic in 2009 and in 2013 we started a phased introduction of childhood flu vaccination program <coughs> excuse me um, based on the LAIV um, nasal spray vaccination and I'll talk a bit more about that in a while this is all our um, uptake from last season and this is um, all the risk groups over 65 years, etc. cetera. Um, what I didn't mention earlier is that all our vaccination is provided free to uh, people in eligible groups. Um, I just want to draw your attention to two um, of the uptake levels. The uptake level in four-year-olds at 33.8% and also in healthcare workers at 63.4% because I'm going to come back to those a bit later on. So this is the eligibility for the current season, which we're halfway through. Um, <clears throat> and I mentioned in the last slide the uh, four-year-olds. Um, last year, four-year-old delivery was done in general practice. So last year, general practice delivered two, three, and four-year-old vaccinations, and then the older age groups were provided in the school setting. Four-year-olds were on the cusp of their education debut, and um, so some of them were at school and some of them weren't. Um, and the uptake in that group was uh, lower than the other preschool-aged children, mainly because of that crossover period. 
So um, it was more complex for parents to get them to the GP for their vaccination. And so for this year, we've moved the four-year-old age group into the um, school programme. So we had two years um, of vaccination being delivered in um, general practice. So that's the preschool, two-year-olds and three-year-olds. And then the rest of the school immunisation programme's been delivered in uh, the school setting. So that's school ages, or school years, not to four. So five years in, in school setting. The other category that we've uh, recently added to our at-risk groups is those with morbid obesity. Just a list of the uh, clinical risk group eligibility. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, just to give you an idea of what we include. And as I mentioned earlier, we also like to protect, protect those who care for people in at-risk groups. So we offer immunisation to um, people staying in long-term ter residential care homes, those in receipt of a carer's alliance, household contacts of those who are immunosuppressed, and health and social care staff in direct contact with patients or service users. So it's quite an extensive programme. Um, and this time of year is extremely busy. We never stop planning for our flu programme, so our flu programme um, is in the planning and implementation stage 12 months a year. We have um, flu boards on a monthly basis with representatives from Public Health England, Department of Health, NHS England and various other stakeholders get together to um, discuss the flu programme, how it's going. At this point of the year, we're very focused on current um, programme but from next month onwards, we will be talking about what's going to happen next year as well. So it's a constant planning cycle. And I'll get to the input of nurses. Nurse input is essential to the success of our program. Um, we have nurses working, um, giving them that, the um, vast majority of immunizations within the program, whether that's in the general practice setting by practice nurses or in the school setting by teams of immunisation uh, nurses. So in, in, in our country, immunisation is a nurse-led activity. Um, pregnant women, we recently added, relatively recently added to the programme, um, are again mainly vaccinated <coughs> in general practice by, by a nurse. Um, but uptake wasn't great, and so we've been um, engaging with maternity services more. One of the issues in primary care was identifying pregnant women. Sometimes they weren't visiting the general practice, they would be seen in maternity services. So we went to where the women were and have engaged with maternity services. And now around 70% of maternity services are offering immunization and signposting where they can't deliver the immunization there. They will signpost the woman to general practice. These, I think, are the three key roles for nurse involvement in the flu vaccine program, advocacy, as a recipient themselves and as a deliverer of immunization. This is an increasingly important role, I feel. Um, like with HPV, we have had an increase in um, anti-vaccination activity within uh, the flu program. This has included uh, writing to head teachers where the school program's been delivered, um, pointing out the risks, of, sorry, the uh, misunderstood risks of the, the, of the flu vaccination and asking the head teachers not to run the program in the schools. Interestingly, we haven't had a lot of traction within the country. The head teachers haven't been um, swayed by these arguments and uptake remains reasonably high within the school setting. Um, this slide is from our tracking surveys um, and I think this demonstrates why um, healthcare professionals, including nurses, are the very important sources of advocating for our vaccines. 
We've run this survey over 20 years and we're able to track over time um, attitudes of parents. This is run in parents of uh, infants and preschool children. And, and you can see that, that there's a very high level of trust in um, information given by GPs, health visitors or practice nurses. So as advocates for immunization, health professionals are really, really important. Um, as you can see down the bottom, uh, media. There isn't a lot of trust in the media despite what um, people might think and that's really shows, demonstrates how important it is to make sure that our nurses and our doctors have the information about vaccination, our confidence in their um, discussions with parents um, because people really trust what they're saying. So it's really, really important that we have good training and um, for our health professionals so that they can have these really important discussions with parents about the safety and effectiveness of vaccines. This is showing the same information really, but tracked over time. As you can see, um, most of you will be aware that um, we had a, a, an issue, a crisis in vaccination with MMR back in the um, late 90s, early 2000s. And as you can see, trust in all sources has, has raised over time. Um, and it really took a, a long time before we were back to the trust of level we had before the MMR crisis. But as you can see there, trust in um, healthcare professionals has risen and remains reasonably high. So next I want to talk about uh, the importance of the nurse as a recipient of influenza vaccine. There's been a lot of um, <clears throat> media coverage of this, and this is despite Brexit. We, we still have some other issues in the news, um, flu being one. Simon Stevens, who's the head of NHS England, um, brought to the attention the severe flu um, season that they had in Australia and was lobbying the government to provide more money because the NHS is already under considerable pressure and um, he was drawing the attention that if we had a severe flu season then um, the NHS wouldn't be able to cope. We also know from our vaccine effectiveness studies that in um, the elderly, particularly those over 75, the inactivated flu vaccine um, shows no significant effectiveness. So it's really important that the people that are caring for the people in those groups are protected themselves. So a flu, severe flu um, has a serious impact on patient hospital services. Um, this can include the use of a very valuable short supply um, intensive care treatment, breathing apparatus, etc. Disrupt healthcare if you've got staff off. If you've got, um, we had a lot of outbreaks last year in care homes, which meant that some of these care homes had to be closed, meaning that um, patients couldn't be discharged from hospital. Um, you can have cancellation of elective admissions and obviously shortages of healthcare workers if you've got a flu outbreak in, in healthcare. So it's really important that as many people as possible are, are vaccinated. We know that um, nurses in particular have um, same views as the general public with regards to flu immunization. And we've done a lot of work um, recently to increase awareness of the flu vaccination and the importance of why nurses should have it. Um, we've we've um, worked with uh, an organization in, inside the NHS to um, provide a website called Flu Fighters. It's worth having a look if you, if you um, get time. And this provides very specific information for NHS trusts that are providing flu vaccination to their staff, including um, information around why it's really important that people should have it and that you can have a, a very mild form of flu as a healthcare worker, which means that you still might be at work, but that you're increased risk of, of spreading that infection on to um, your patients. 
So that's been really, really effective. Um, in the last year, I, I highlighted the uptake in healthcare workers at around 66% last year. Um, and that some of that is due to um, some of that is due to the measures that we've taken to raise awareness and talking to healthcare professionals about flu. But the main reason was that last year the um, Department of Health uh, uh, announced a payment system for trusts, an incentive system, if you like, for trusts that achieve high uptake. Um, and so, the more, the higher the uptake, the more payment the the trusts get for um, delivering flu vaccination. This has also highlighted the importance that the Department of Health put on high rates of immunisation in healthcare workers. And I mentioned earlier that nurses deliver most of the um, immunisations in the country, but I thought I'd focus on LAIV as an example. This program was set up in um, 2013 vo following recommendation by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, which is the uh, NITAG in the UK. And this program was based on the premise that um, children were very effective carriers of flu and by immunising children, um, even at moderate rates of uptake, you could potentially stop the spread of flu within the um, community. So you provide direct protection to the child and then also indirect protection to their family and community members. Because of the size of the programme and the necessity to get the vaccination between October and December, um, the JCBI recommended a phased introduction and so in 2013, um, seven pilot areas were set up around the country to um, test all aspects of the programme, to test whether parents were accepting of it, to test whether, um, whether it could be run in the school setting, to test um, all the delivery systems, to work out what models work the best, um, and also to test the surveillance systems in place. Um, in that first year, most of the um, immunisation for school-aged children was delivered in the school setting, <coughs> although there was one area who piloted it in a pharmacy setting. It, this was because it was a more rural area. And we also had one of the providers was a private company. Um, in the other areas, it was uh, NHS provision. Did the program work? Yes, we believe it did, does. Um, the children seemed to enjoy. I, I, I went round all the areas and actually saw a lot of the immunisation sessions and the children seemed to enjoy the experience. Um, <clears throat> so this was in uh, the results from the pilot in 2014-15 <coughs> and this was actually the year where the uh, strains had drifted in the... Um, Sorry, the strains circulating in the community had drifted from the vaccine strains uh, and the immunisation, the inactivated immunisation had not been very effective at all in adults and yet we were still able to demonstrate good effectiveness with LIAIV. I must learn to say that if I'm going to present about it. Um, so in, as you can see there, primary school, th this, this comparison is pilot areas versus non-pilot areas. And as you can see there, there was a big reduction in um, consultations to general practice for influenza-like illness um, in primary school children, also A&E respiratory attendances and hospital admissions. But there on the other side, you can see there's 59% reduction in influenza-like consultations um, in adults who were not targeted for vaccination, demonstrating the indirect effect of the programme. So still more to do. <clears throat> We're still aware that there's a need to increase the uptake for frontline staff, particularly in the social care settings. We've worked really hard and got a reasonable uptake in um, healthcare workers, but social care staff, um, there's still a lot more to do. So we're increasing engagement with that sector currently. 
We want to increase awareness and immunisation delivery in secondary care settings. And this is mainly because in our at-risk groups, there's wide variability in uptake rates depending on the at-risk group that people are in. And for some of the conditions, including liver disease, uptake is much lower than other conditions such as diabetes. <clears throat> a lot of this is around identification of these people, um, it, particularly through gen general practice records. So the idea is that if we go to the consultants that are looking after these people and the specialist nurses in secondary care settings, then maybe we'll be able to work with them to increase uptake um, in the, these groups who are particularly vulnerable to the complications of flu. We also want to increase our engagement with um, preschool care providers, and this is due to a low the uptake in two and three year olds in primary care um, is reasonably good. We still there's still work to be done, and we know that these are the children that are have great um, contacts with other members of the of the community, whether it's grandparents, younger siblings. Um, they just have in contact with lots of people. So we want to make sure as many of uh, preschool children are immunized as possible. So we're aware that there's still lots of work to do. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>